ICANN Security and Stability Advisory Committee, of which uh, I'm a member and, uh, and so is uh, one of the, the, the panelists as well. Um, for the last couple of years, uh, ICANN has a variety of different entities in its structure, and there's one advisory group, which is a group that, that works on security and stability um, issues at, at ICANN. And we, um, for the last couple of years, have proposed and have had sessions uh, accepted um, at, um, at the IGF. Um, those of us, it, it's on the workshop description. Um, and over, uh, for, for this IGF, um, what we thought we'd do, and we'll, we'll get into it, it's, this is going to be a, a, uh, a quite lively and dynamic session. Um, the title is Dangers to the Internet Economy from Irresponsibility at Scale. I'll get more into this at the end of the talk, but it's more that stakeholders working together um, and sharing best practices um, achieve uh, better results, and if not, not working together um, can cause great consequences and economic harm. And um, I am co-moderating the session with uh, my colleague Jenny Phillips from, from the Citizen Lab. Um, and what I'm going to ask is we have two parts of the presentation, which uh, Jenny will, will describe. Um, um, but the, there's, there's two parts, and it's, the second half will be a bit more interactive than the first. Um, and I think for the first time in the ESSAC, if I, you exclude the moderator, it is an all-female cast uh, that will be involved in a cybersecurity discussion um, at the IGF. So I look forward uh, to that. Um, and so I will just pass it to Jenny to make some comments. We'll start with uh, the panel, and then we'll proceed to our second half. Jenny, over to you. So we're going to try to stand for a lot of this discussion, just because it's end of the day and we want to keep the energy up. Uh, so I'm just going to do a little bit of an introduction, and then we'll actually get into the discussion. Uh, I'll show you our objectives so you know where we're going to go today. Uh, so primarily we're looking to demonstrate the risks associated with preparing for crisis. We'll be pre presenting strategies to help you prepare for crisis, demonstrating the value of collaboration prior to, during, and post-crisis, and demonstrating the value added to this area of research. And we've broken down our workshop into two parts, but I sort of explained it in three here. So we have four separate talks that are going to happen. We're going to be starting with Mary Kay, and then we're going to do a remote, participa remote participation from our colleague, Chris Gore, who stayed up and is awake right now at 4.30 a.m. in the morning. So we're very proud and happy to have him with us. Uh, and then we'll have a discussion by Christine. Each of them will introduce themselves, and then I will go last. Um, now, the discussion that I will be giving, if it goes, maybe I need to be closer. There, that's a bit better. Um, so this workshop was actually uh, a bit of a research project in itself, and that prior to designing this workshop, we actually came up with a list of questions and actually interviewed experts in a variety of different fields. So we tried to talk to people in emergency management, people in health, people in business, and take their different perspectives on security uh, and different perspectives on crisis and preparedness and things like that. Um, so just to give you a quick overview, these are the questions we asked. I, when I give my talk, I'll be going through what the answers from the experts were, were on each of these questions, but it's worth it just to, keep a, to do a quick skim of the questions to think in the back of your mind when you watch the other presentations. And then the last part will be a situation room. It's going to be really exciting. We can do a little bit of role playing. Uh, so I will pass the mic over to Mary Kay, who's going to try to do this. So I will stand up also since it is the end of the day. And so I will just uh, ask the moderators to switch the slides. So I guess get to the title slide. So this is work um, that we've already been talking about in the ICAM meeting. I am also a member of ESSAC. And um, we've been looking very uh, uh, um, in detail into uh, DNS-related amplification attacks. 
which we have already done over the last 10 years. Um, so I'm going to actually talk about what they are um, and in language that I'm hoping that the non-technical community here will understand and just say, you know, why are we talking about this and why is it such a big issue? So first slide, please. So, um, yeah, so basically I'll uh, have a review of what, what these DNS amplification attacks are, why is this a huge issue, why are these attacks possible, and basically what can we all collectively do about it? Next slide, please. So this is, uh, just shows you what role a recursive DNS server plays. So you have a user device, okay, and I'm, I've pictured a laptop, but the user device can be a washer or a dryer that's connected to the Internet. It can be your tablet. It can be your phone, anything that's connecting to the Internet that somebody's using. So if you go, if you, on your laptops, if you want to go to www.ican.org, right, see what's happening. Basically what happens um, on the technology level is that there's, um, uh, the user device goes to something called a recursive DNS resolver, okay, and there's multiple of these around the globe, and it says, you know, what is the IP address of the website the user wants to go to, okay? Um, these servers may not have that information, and so they then go ask some other devices who are authoritative to say, I don't know the answer, but I need to ask an authoritative source. Okay, and these are called authoritative DNS servers. There's interactions that happen, and then um, eventually the recursive DNS servers get a reply, and then they relay that to the device, and then you get to the website. You as a user don't notice this. Right? There's probably several interchanges that happen, but you within a matter of seconds just get the website. All good to go. So why do I care about these recursive DNS servers? Next slide, please. So amplification attacks um, are happening, and they're happening at very severe levels, which are causing denial of service to many, many services. Um, and so what happens during these attacks? Well, you have, first of all, you have compromised user devices. Okay, how that happens um, is it basically you have some kind of malware in them, and that can happen in many, many different ways. But so these compromised user devices, what ends up happening is that when your, let's say your laptop is compromised. So when you're trying to get to www.ican.org, when you're sending that question to the recursive DNS servers as to how do I get there, um, it will actually, your device will pretend to be Robert's laptop. Okay, and so what, what ends up happening is, you know, it looks to the DNS recursive servers like Robert's laptop is asking the question. So normal stuff happens, right? I mean, the uh, recursive DNS servers don't initially know the answer. They go to the authoritative servers. They get the answer back. And then rather than sending it to your laptop, all the replies go to Robert's laptop because you were forging the actual initial query. So what happens if you have thousands of machines that pretend to be Robert's laptop, right? I mean, you get a very, very large denial of service attack to Robert's app, uh, a laptop or whoever the intended victim is. Next slide, please. And so why is this a huge issue? It's a huge issue um, because they use identifiers of legitimate users um, and the forging is possible due to compromised hosts. So if you're combining these forged identifiers with legitimate protocol use, it makes mitigation extremely difficult because how do you filter? What do you filter on? And also recent trends have been utilizing the domain name service um, as an attack vector since it's a fundamentally used uh, internet technology. So how many of you know what the DNS is? Have you heard of it? Okay, just checking. <laughs> um, and basically how you can exploit this or why it's possible because there's unmanaged open re uh, recursive DNS servers. So basically these per particular DNS servers answer queries from absolutely anybody who asks from all around the world. Also, you have large hosting providers, right? Hosting providers, cloud networks, they may have 100,000, 200,000, a million 
virtual machines. If they get compromised, all of a sudden you've got a million machines at your disposal with large amounts of bandwidth, which means that you could really take out even small countries if you wanted to. You know, think about island countries that may not have that much bandwidth. Um, and also, it's not just relevant to the DNS protocol. There's many, many other protocols that can also be circumvented. And if you're using any kind of forged IP addresses, right, this can be a huge problem. Next slide, please. So why does it work so well? Okay, I mean, here's the problem with dealing with them, that a victim cannot actually see the originator of the attack. So um, there's, most of these packets come from real DNS servers, so you can't tell whether or not it's legitimate or actually something that's not legitimate. Um, and so you cannot just block the queries. So the DNS servers, right, if you're looking at um, your audit logs, it looks like it's just legitimate traffic. The ISPs that are originating the traffic aren't impacted, um, and they only see usually small amounts of data. What makes the attack so, so interesting is that you see uh, uh, packets from all around the world, and the only one that's really impacted where, where you see a large amount of traffic is directly to the victim. Next slide, please. So what needs to be done? And this is the interesting part, because this, these are best practices that have been known for at least 10 years. Right? So there's two things. One is that equipment vendors need to ship these open, um, these uh, recursive DNS servers as closed, which means that you should be able to limit who is able to ask the questions. So, for example, if you're in a government environment, then you have a government network. Only the devices that are on that network should be able to ask the questions of the um, recursive DNS servers that are responsible for that government network. Okay? You should not be able to ask a bank's open uh, a recursive DNS servers for how do I get to www.ican.org. So if, you're, if you should be restricting access. If you don't, that's called an open recursive DNS result, uh, server. Um, the problem also is that many, many best current practice documents, when they show how to configure these devices, these recursive DNS servers, they just happen to uh, uh, show you know, how you configure them, and they leave them as open. So this is a problem in the industry where you have to uh, make sure that the best current practice documents actually meet, you know, what needs to be done from a security perspective. So who's going to be looking at them? Who's going to be changing them? Um, but what's even more important, and, you know, we in the technical community who've been understanding that this is an issue struggle at understanding why people are not doing this on an operational level which is you have to get everybody to participate in stopping the ability to forge identifiers, right? So anybody here in this room, when you're asking the question as to how do I get to www.ican.org, right, you should not be able to spoof traffic or forge traffic that looks like it came from Robert's laptop. And so how does this get done? Well, ISPs or businesses, right, both need to be involved, and to some end, maybe end users even, right? Or, and the only way you can stop it, and I have a picture so you kind of see what ingress or egress means, is that ISPs really should do ingress filtering, which means that they only accept inbound traffic that has a source address from allocated IP address blocks for their uh, particular customers. And enterprises or small businesses or governments really need to implant egress filters and allow only traffic to exit their network that have a source address from their allocated IP address block. And equipment vendors really should have better defaults. And another aspect with all of this is that I think research and measurements are always very useful to actually get definitive data on where this kind of forging is possible so that people know where it's happening and maybe can get educated. Next slide, please. 
So this slide is quite technical. The only thing I want to point out is that in my house, right, I have a, a CPE device, right, maybe because um, I have a DSL line still. And my, my device that connects me to my ISP, I actually have it configured so that the only traffic that gets sent out knows that it's from an address that I, um, I got from my ISP. Okay, and businesses should do that too. That's called egress filtering. So from my router or business router that connects up to an ISP, if you put some kind of uh, filter on there to say, yep, you know, allow only this traffic, then that's called egress filtering because you're leaving the network. On the flip side, right, you have ingress filtering when you're looking at traffic that's coming into your network, right? And so from an ISP's perspective, they should only be filtering traffic well, um, that they know came from me or from a business. Next slide, please. So um, I think you'll have these slides available. There's an openresolverproject.org that shows where open resolvers are. Remember, we have to stop spoof traffic, like the ability for people to be able to forge traffic, and also with this particular problem, we need to be able to stop uh, unmanaged open recursive resolvers. Next slide, please. I always look at, the, I show this slide because people, and I've been in a number of different sessions where people ask, what is security, what do I do? You know, I always look at five or six things that I recommend, um, and it doesn't matter what area of network you look at, application, host, network, but these are the six principles that I always tell people you should look at. One is effective credential management process, right? whether or not you're using certificates or two-factor authentication or passwords, how do you create it, revoke it, distribute it, and all that. I mean, create an effective process for that. Number two is restrict access to applications, hosts, and network segments. This restriction, this principle, speaks directly to not having open recursive DNS servers, but having closed ones. It also speaks to make sure you have anti-spoof filters, right, because you're restricting access for um, specific network segments and, and who's allowed to have access to certain devices. So it's a major principle, it's a fundamental security practice, and it's, it's interesting how many people don't really follow that. Um, the other ones I won't go through because of time. Next slide, please. So parting thought is we do need continued international collaboration to help equipment manufacturers and users. Um, there is already extremely great dialogue between research, operational, and CERC communities and it also um, is getting to be inclusive of law enforcement and government as well. And measurements to identify problem areas are useful to ascertain which constituents need better education. And so that's it for my presentation right now. Thank you. So just, um, just before the next uh, speaker is, we did something what I would say is a remote participant plus. Uh, recognizing the differences in time zone, we actually had a remote participant basically have his presentation ready and actually record it. Um, and so we're actually going to play um, because it's 4 a.m. in the morning for, for the participant. And so um, Chris Gore will introduce himself and he'll go over his slides. So I just want to check a reset. Uh, Christine, we just have a technology issue. Christine, could you go, please? I think people are having a lot of technology issues now, so I'm going to try and have a timer here. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about this irresponsibility at scale from, from the perspective of a CERT. I'm from CERT BR. I've been at CERTBR for 15 years now, and we have been seeing a lot of problems and, and issues to evolve uh, in this past few years. And, and basically, from our perspective, what we see is, is basically uh, any attacks that are possible or that are amplified, like Mary Kay just uh, explained to us, by the lack of implementation of best practices. And usually we are talking about denial of service or in the case of use of open recursive or other technologies people call denial of refractive distributed 
uh, service or whatever. But the idea, it's really, you can go to the next one. I was just, so it's, it's really that um, from the perspective of someone that is actually perpetrating the attack, the attack, there's no immediate benefit into implementing a best practice. So what do I gain from it? Usually that is the question. And the effects of the attack, as in the ex specific example of DNS amplification and recursion, it's that the network or computers being abused, they don't actually see that much activity. For them, it's not an impact. And usually to implement something, there is a cost. From the perspective of the person being attacked, it usually means that there's almost nothing that you can do to, to prevent that attack. For example, in, in the recent uh, DDoS attacks, there was no way you could actually survive that. Uh, it is really uh, too much attack from the perspective of networks attacking. That was not big. For the perspective of the vi victim, that's big. And I think this spam is also a problem like that. Because from the perspective of the networks that are actually being abused by criminals and spammers, uh, there is not traffic loss, there is no problems, those are machines infected, that's a problem that's piling up. But from the perspective of people receiving the emails, we are all just crazy with spam filters, with our messages being lost, with phishing, with uh, crime war going around, and uh, we are just struggling into doing that. So I think if I would summarize what that problem is, it's really a problem that uh, there is no incentive to implement the best practices. They are out there, several of them, but there is no economic incentive, and there is any other one. So next slide, please. Uh, and I would expand a little bit without talking about policy making, and, but really I think it's not only a network and ISP problem. Uh, is that uh, vision that someone else needs to do something. That happens a lot, that we see, oh, that's not my problem. And usually that goes also for software development, that they think, oh, security is something that someone else is going to do at some time, at some point, at some cost, it's not mine, it's not my problem. Uh, and they don't see it as something that needs to be incorporated from the design to the, man the deployment to the maintenance. And, and that is, I think, a problem with the whole industry. And I see something similar with the standards community, that usually they think about a new standard just from the point of view, okay, let's do it. And then, they, oh, there's a vulnerability, so let's create another standard to try to tackle that vulnerability. And it's, it's really this lack of mindset, security mindset. It's really thinking about security and the impacts. And this has a big impact on what we are talking now because most of the best practices we need to implement are to mitigate bad design of some of the technologies. So I think it's just thinking about the future. Next slide, please. And uh, one of the things that we are seeing, as she said, for example, for DNS and open recursives, we have best practices for more than 10 years now. And no one is implementing them. They are just being postponed. People are just are thinking, I don't need to do it. So we are going for anti-spoofing, as she was describing, for botnet remediation. That's a big problem. And I'm not talking about mitigation of, mitigations of attacks perpetrated by botnets, but really how to disinfect all the devices and how to prevent them from being reinfected. It's a huge problem. Uh, and user awareness is also something that uh, really people think, tend to say, oh, that's too complicated. So we actually tend not to do anything. But at least the end users, they need to have the right to know the risks. We know the risks of crossing the street, the risk of doing something. And more common than not, we see that sometimes users, they overestimate the risk. So it's, it's a problem that they just get scared. And what we are seeing a lot, too, with best practices, uh, I put here that's the chicken and the egg dilemma, that we are seeing with some of the technologies that we have there, like DNSSEC. What we hear, but why you don't sign your zone? Why you don't use it? Oh, because no one is checking. Then we ask for ISPs, why are you not checking the NSEC? Because no one is signing domains. So it's kind of this thing that no one wants to give the first step. No one is actually willing to start the whole thing. Uh, the same thing with routing security. So the standards are there, but 
it's that feeling that everybody needs to jump at the same time. And there are other problems that will become worse and worse, like PKIs or ISP. So it's, it's really something that the community need to talk and need to think about what to do. Uh, next slide, please. So I would just like to give some examples of some things that we are trying to implement in Brazil, some we implemented with success, that are some of the ways that we are trying to deal with it. We haven't solved the problem yet. I think we gave some first steps, but I think these are some of the challenges. So next, please. One, um, I would talk a little bit about Port 25 management. You don't need actually to think too much about the technical thing in here, but really, this is uh, one technique to stop infected machines from uh, delivering spam. It's been a recommendation since 2005, at least, from MOG, from OECG, from FTC, from almost all the bodies. But uh, not all countries have implemented and not all networks. So um, the recommendation is there, so why people don't implement? Like we had this problem in Brazil, we were recommending forever. Why? Why are you not adopting? And then when we started some conversations with the different sectors, uh, several issues came. So legal issues, consumer protection organizations were afraid that that would affect the consumer's rights. We had uh, regulatory problems. We had technical people saying, oh, but all my network is going to stop to work. Uh, there are costs involved. Uh, the managers were saying, oh, but I need to spend money to implement that, and what's my gain? What's I'm going to gain with stopping spam from leaving my network? So I, I think this is really one of the issues. Next slide, please. And it was not easy, but we tried to get all the people on the table. We thought that we got all the people when we got regulators, ISPs, telcos, and everyone. Then we needed to go for federal prosecute officers, for consumer defense organizations, and try to explain why that was good. And then at the end, we had to go to a very formal process of agreements for people to do it. And it was not an easy process, but the result was good. Next slide, please. What we saw uh, after seven years of meetings, talks, uh, we actually implemented that in the beginning of 2013. We started in 2011. We could see a drop on spam complaints to cert PR, a huge drop. Next slide, please. And we also were, uh, Brazil was, was labeled in 2009 as the king of spam, was the country with that would generate most spam in the world. We were in the front lines of all the technical organizations. On CBL, we were number one. And after implementing it, we just went to a much better place now. And a lot of people in the beginning didn't believe that the best practice would work. They would just say, this is not going to have any effect. Or they would say, is this going to solve 100% of the problems? And then we said, no. But it's going to solve part of the problem. It's going to make it more expensive uh, to send spam. It is going to stop people abusing our networks. And it would get us to a better place. Next slide, please. And I think some other examples we are seeing, a lot of people talked about the European Union, uh, ACDC um, initiative, but really to think about end users, and end user protection is important because we have today this huge base of infected machines. Uh, we are starting to see end user devices, mobile devices, other devices infected, and we all need to be more proactive. Uh, we are hearing now from the ISPs, oh, the end user device is not my problem. Then we tend just to say, okay, but you are the one that has the contact of the user that can reach them. And we are seeing here, we just made a list of all the initiatives that we know that people are already doing something. We are starting to try and do this in Brazil too, to get this problem that is really this idea that it's not my problem and try to make it, try to educate the users uh, into doing that and enlist the ISPs. Can we just go for the next one? Uh, another thing is that we need to try and make uh, security more appealing for end users. So, of course, they will not pay attention to us talking about BCPs and whatever that we talk in Geek Talk. 
but we need to try and make them understand the risks. So we are trying to do a lot of material and, and to reach them. Uh, next slide, please. But we also need to try and make it easier for the ISPs and system administrators to implement the BCPs. When we were talking about anti-spoofing, specifically for DNS recursive, most of the people said, yeah, but those RFCs are very complex, and most information is in English, and they don't have examples on how to implement it, and I'm afraid that I'm going to break something. So another thing we are trying to do is how to translate to some easier language and make it easier for people to really implement that. So uh, this is more or less our take. I think this is the last slide. And it's just, uh, I hope that this could bring to people some of the challenges we are seeing. We don't have all the answers, but we are trying to enlist more people to, to deal with the problem now. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Christopher Gore. I'm a professor of politics at Ryerson University in Toronto, Canada. Uh, I'm sorry I could not join you in person today, but I'm delighted to have the opportunity to, to share some thoughts with the panel remotely uh, and hopefully respond to some questions or participate in the discussion uh, online. Um, in the last few years, I've had the opportunity to collaborate with the Citizens Lab at the University of Toronto uh, my thoughts today are, arise from some ongoing conversations with the Citizen Lab and the many cyber stewards uh, that they are working with. So uh, most often at events like the IGF or other events focused on cyber issues, uh, an eclectic group of people are present with varying interests uh, and certainly focuses. Um, as a researcher, one of the broad issues that seems to hold the community together is a question about how social and political systems are responding to the technological evolution or revolution that we are all witnessing, and questions about how various interests respond to that evolution. Uh, furthermore, how do the technical, social, economic, and political systems uh, converge and compete to produce various outcomes uh, for those systems, in particular cyber infrastructure? So for the last 10 years, uh, one of the things I've been studying is how international organizations, civil society, and national governments in sub-Saharan Africa have responded to the provision of one critical infrastructure system, and that's electricity. Um, for me, this interest began a decade ago when conducting research in the country of Uganda, a country at the time where only 5% of its population had access to electricity. But that was, at the same time, starting to see the emergence of phenomenal transformation in mobile phone and internet access. Many people were anticipating a parallel revolution in information and communications technology. But in Uganda, the telecommunications market had been liberalized, web cafes were springing up everywhere, internet access and use was increasing, and the rate of mobile phone adoption was expanding exponentially. But two questions struck me as really unclear at this time. The first is, how are these various infrastructure systems being governed, independently or with consideration of the other? And more pragmatically, how can this cyber revolution take place in the absence of the electrical power necessary to support the technology? So one of the central issues I want to highlight today is whether there are lessons about security and governance from electricity that can be applied to cyber issues today, particularly owing to the ongoing debates and tensions about the decentralized character and governance of the internet. While well, statistics about internet act, uh, uptake are imperfect, in most cases there's a pretty obvious uh, trend uh, that we can see in many countries, and that is that the percent increase in individual internet users usually correlates with the character of a given regime and the character of the market for internet access. So looking at this table, you see that there is an overall upward trend with the exception of Ethiopia. So how is Kenya and Uganda, or how are, sorry, Kenya and Uganda different than Ethiopia with respect to Internet access? The state provides access to the Internet while in Ethiopia, while Kenya and Uganda are more liberalized markets. 
Now, that is an easy correlation to make, albeit imperfect. But what it does not tell us is how other infrastructure, regulatory, and governance systems influence access to and freedom and security of Internet use in other countries under various regimes. So a big challenge that is confronted is how to think about these various systems simultaneously to facilitate the benefits of access being realized, secured, and maintained. But this is a very big task. From studies of infrastructure systems, we know that three things shape people's use and access. The physical or technical system, the governance of the system, and individual behavior. And each of these factors are influenced by multiple other systems. Now, the parallels between electricity and infrastructure uh, sorry, internet infrastructure are imperfect, but I think there are some important lessons about the provision and governance of electricity that can be helpful when considering access, governance, and security of the internet. So what can we learn about cyber infrastructure and access from electricity? I want to highlight three lessons or three things that I think are important, important to consider. Now, first is how we actually talk about access to infrastructure influences policies and programs that facilitate and regulate that access. Infrastructure systems are not neutral and are certainly not universal. For example, the map of fiber optic cables shows that there are only three transatlantic cables that reach the east coast of Africa, while three cables reach the small Central American country of Panama. For electricity, we used to measure success in expansion of electricity in relation to the number of people that were connected. Now, international organizations don't talk about universal connections, they talk about universal access. That is, how many people could have access, even if that doesn't mean that they actually have any connection to their household. This means that you could be counting, counted, sorry, uh, excuse me, counted as having access even if you do not have connection to that, that uh, infrastructure system. Hence, if electricity is near your home, but you can't afford to be connected to it, you are still deemed to have access. The lesson here is that how we talk about access to infrastructure systems influences the programs and the practices that guide uh, expansion and guide access. So precision is needed. Secondly, the history of electricity infrastructure is replete with debates about centralization and decentralization. When electricity systems were expanding originally, Many private providers existed and were delivering electricity at different voltages in a decentralized system. There was no ICANN for electricity. Eventually, governments decided that this was not safe and not reliable, nor was it going to facilitate access quickly. So in the name of improved access and security and safety, electricity systems were monopolized and standards were put in place and investments in expansion were widespread. Now that worked well for countries quickly industrializing, but it was a model that was not maintained for poor countries as it was costly to provide electricity for governments and owing to new arguments that reliance on centralized systems could be less reliant, or excuse me, resilient than decentralized systems. The outcome of this, particularly in the developing world and particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, was to privatize electricity systems and hope that competition would lead to faster expansion. Now, while some call this deregulation, in reality what it was was re-regulation. And it was not supposed to be a lessening role for the state, but a new role for the state. The result is that advocacy for a decentralized system and electricity provision increased the importance of the state in guiding security and advocating for access. The degree of success, however, was dependent on civil society advocacy for access and very careful and constant monitoring of private providers. If left to their own devices, private firms would only offer electricity where it was easy and profitable to roll it out. Thus, the lesson is that as infrastructure systems evolve, there is need for a very careful reflection on the balance and guidance the state offers in the evolution of decentralized systems. The last lesson that I want to highlight is that infrastructure systems are complementary. For most, this is very well known. But we can't think about expanding Internet access without also thinking about access to other complementary systems. 
For example, because electricity is unreliable in Kenya, one of the leading mobile providers, Safaricom, maintains a fleet of approximately 100 fuel trucks in the case of blackouts so that it can refuel the diesel generators used as backup for its mobile phone towers. Hence, internet and infrastructure security and reliability um, are a function of multiple systems, and the onus is on civil society and governments and researchers to consider their interaction. So when we talk about internet governance, it's important to think about how internet governance relates to other governance systems. We know that the internet is a decentralized system which has helped to promote its innovation. When we think about the telecom industry and radio and television and phone, we see there's a high degree of regulation which governs both private access, uh, uh, private roles and the government oversight. With electricity, we see a very mixed medley of systems that are both centralized and decentralized, liberalized and monopolies that have weak innovations and high barriers to entry. We need to recognize the systems that compete and converge with the structure of Internet governance and lessons from those other systems. What happens, for example, in a national context when you have a liberalized telecommunications market but a monopoly, natural or intended, in electricity precision? Two systems that are complementary but regulated by different actors. Let's take the example of Uganda as a final case. It has a liberalized telecommunications network with a national regulator. When there is an interruption in SMS services or access to Facebook, who is to blame? Who is accountable? Interruptions in telecom services in Yanda uh, occurred in the last few years, particularly around times of civil unrest or civil protests. The regulator, regula uh, regulator said, no, it wasn't them. The telecom said, no, it wasn't them. But pay Facebook and SMS um, sites uh, uh, we're blocked, and some power is out in parts of the country. The onus is, therefore, to more carefully examine lines of accountability in a decentralized system and to push for transparency. I want to conclude today, sorry, uh, I would like to conclude today by raising some observations and questions about infrastructure systems generally and the governance of infrastructure specifically. From studies of infrastructure and risk preparedness, we know that society and government are usually better prepared for low probability, high risk events like earthquakes than for low probability, low impact events. This is because the impact of the high risk event is large. In each country, the impact of an internet shutdown will vary, for example, but the probability of shutdown is going to be a function of the integrity and resiliency of multiple systems, including infrastructure, and the character of how those systems are governed and the character of state-society relations. So my first observation is that there is benefit in trying to think about cybersecurity issues in anticipation of the conditions and systems that security is dependent on. In turn, if the probability of shutdown is high or failure is high, how does civil society, excuse me, how does civil society prepare for this, and work to minimize the impact. From this observation, I want to f end with two questions that I think are, should be considered and certainly arise about the responsibility for infrastructure and cybersecurity governance. Many will know the work of Jan Chipkes. One of the things that he has discussed is a great, uh, a great deal is that technology functions as a tool to delegate our activities. Given the impact of failure in infrastructure systems, and the risks and vulnerabilities that follow from failures in infrastructure systems, it is also important to consider delegation in relation to the governance of infrastructure systems. What responsibilities do we want to delegate to ourselves, to governments, and to third parties? I know that this question is under deep debate and ongoing debate amongst the cyber community. But under what conditions do we want to de delegate security to, to various actors? I think it's important to start to think about cybersecurity in relation to the other systems and structures that affect the integrity and openness of cyber systems, and to think carefully about how the governance of different systems connected to the Internet can have deep impacts on the vulnerability and integrity of cyber infrastructure. What, for example, are the implications of a decentralized electricity distribution system in a country with a liberalized telecommunications sector? Is that a model that we will ensure infrastructure security? and regulatory clarity and accountability? 
Lastly, we can all accept and recognize that the decentralized character of the Internet is what has enabled its innovation and its democratizing potential. But as the character of this decentralized system is challenged by governments, it is important to remember that the integrity of the Internet is a function of the integrity of other infrastructure and governance systems, and that there are lessons to be learned from these other systems with respect to how international organizations, governments, private firms, and citizens have debated the rationale for more closed and open governance. Hence, collectively, there is a need to examine under what conditions, social, political, technical, vulnerability of infrastructure systems, higher or lower, and work collectively to promote those conditions. Thank you very much for your time. So, as I mentioned, there, there are two parts of, of, the present, of, of the session. We're going to pick up a pace um, and have a far more interactive piece. But before I get to that second part, um, if we have any question for um, the two panelists that are here and the one that's remote, Ali is doing the remote participation. Just any questions from the audience? Here's a, here's a mic. Uh, I'm Walid al Sakaf. Um, a question is about DNS security. You may have heard that ICANN in 46 in Beijing had given a workshop about the DNSSEC and how it's important to begin implementing it on various levels from root to uh, local or national servers. So what do you uh, take out of this and do you believe it could be really the solution to many of those fraudulent methods of uh, DNS hacking? As with any security practice, uh, not one particular technology will actually solve all issues. So I do believe that DNSSEC will um, help a lot of issues where DNSSEC can, uh, DNS can be circumvented. I also believe that looking at closing these unmanaged open um, uh, DNS uh, ser uh, uh, recursive servers is another aspect along with also helping to stop uh, being able to forge uh, traffic, so forge, uh, uh, stop being able to do spoofing of IP addresses. So, but I think that DNSSEC is one part of the overall equation. And a comment that I want to make here is that, you know, w w w the title of this talk is really one where, and I think Christine will absolutely agree with me, is that the best current practices have been around for so long, and what we find is that people are not doing the fundamentals. And, you know, I think we all have heard of attacks um, that are happening almost on a daily, weekly basis that are now getting in the widespread media. I am not at all surprised that this is going on because I see that nobody has been implementing the fundamental best practices which are really enabling the criminal underground to take advantage of all of these devices and then, you know, um, create these denial of service attacks or other criminal activity. And the reason for this session is that really we want to raise the awareness that something needs to be done. I don't think it's necessarily regulation, but I very much applaud Brazil for, I mean, spending seven years right, bringing the constituents together, but actually solving at least one piece of the puzzle. And we, how do we do this within our own countries, our own nations, to really help the overall resiliency of the entire global Internet? Um, just a small comment on TNSSEC. I think it's important to know, and this is something to always say, it will not solve all problems, and it will not solve all means that people can do fraud and phishing and whatever. It solves one big problem of DNS and it lays a path for us to be able to use DNSSEC as a tool to help in other areas. We can use DNSSEC to implement other protocols. So it's a move that needs to be done. And if people keep second guessing and saying, oh, it's not going to solve our problems, so I'm not going to do it. And this is what we are seeing. These fundamental practices are not implemented because people are looking for something that does not exist. There's no solution for all, and there's no one single solution. And especially, uh, we need just to keep the problem more manageable. 
we need to be able to have a problem in a smaller scale than the problem that we have today. And I think uh, this is something that we all need to, to work and need to understand. And we need to understand that some people have doubts and on some people will actually uh, be afraid, okay, this is going to impact me on a daily life basis and how do I move and how do I guarantee that this best practice will not hinder other areas like privacy, uh, human rights or other issues. So I think this is why it took us so many years to implement something in Brazil. But it really laid the path for us to now move forward to other areas of best practices. And I think now it's not going to take that long anymore for other practices. So now we're going to proceed to part two. Okay. So uh, looking around the room, I see some n people nodding off. So I'll try to up the energy a little bit, <laughs> do what I can. Um, so I didn't really introduce myself before, but I'm Jenny Phillips. I'm a doctoral student at the University of Toronto. Uh, I research emergency management related things. So I'm specifically looking at how to develop resilience using virtual networks. Um, but I've had some pretty cool experiences. I've worked with the Prime Minister's office. I've worked with Foreign Affairs in Canada on different emergency management related training sorts of initiatives. I was a training specialist there. Um, so I've been working in this area for a while and it's pretty interesting. Most people don't like to think about doomsday, but I get to think about it every day. Um, so it's good times. So my talk is called Security from Multiple Lenses. Can you tell what that is? that's a picture of? What? Multiple lenses. Robert thought it was a beehive. When actually, it was, it's supposed to be the uh, parts of a fly. You know how a fly has multiple lenses in the way they look? I tried to emulate the multiple lenses with my picture here. Um, so really the objective of this talk is to really help us get our heads out of the sand. How many of us here are techies? Okay, not everybody. Okay, most people would say that, do, how many people work in technology even, but would not necessarily say they're techie? Okay, all right. Well, what I really wanted to do was to draw on experts that aren't even close to techies and they aren't really working in a techie field and see what insight they might be able to add to this discussion. And I'll have to move according to where my remote wants me to go. Okay, so like I was sort of alluding to in the beginning, I relied on four different expert groups. The first was I went to my old colleagues at Foreign Affairs in Canada and talked to the uh, emergency management and phys physical security crew. I also talked to organizational resilience experts uh, focused in New Zealand, which, I will, where, which, which is where I'm going to be going to visit in a few weeks. So if you have any good travel tips, let me know. Uh, I also talked to people in health, so I talked to medicines or Doctors Without Borders, MSF, and Internet. I, I actually got Christine here to do a, the survey for me as well. So we have a little bit of the digital perspective added on. Yeah. There. Okay, so I'm going to try to keep the context of the different experts short. The part that I found really interesting was actually looking at the lessons they have that they can share to this group and what they'd like to know from this group and from others. So the government piece. What is a secure government? Uh, when I talk to them, essentially to foreign affairs, government involves two pieces, your domestic and your international. Your domestic is, in many, is your physical security, so it, it's your security guards, your security cameras. And from an international perspective, it's training, for harsh, it's training for harsh climates. It's the safety and security of Canadians abroad. Uh, Canadians, obviously, in Canada are, are a, a concern as well. Um, keep in mind, this is an emergency management perspective. This isn't a, a, a broader CSEC, uh, NSA type perspective. I only had a few weeks to do this to do this research, by the way, so it's only in the early stages. Uh, 
So the next one, what is a secure organization? Some of the key points that he brought out uh, was that it's dependent on context and that it's a change that it, it's change ready. And it's the safety of employees and the reputation of an organization. What is security and health? Protection of people, assets, and reputation. And what is secure internet? It's systems connected to the internet maintaining confidentiality, availability, and integrity. So what are the critical security issues? For each of these groups, emergency management's main comment was the issues are, are unique to the service, to the point of service based on individual threats. So that's for the different embassies, they each have different security issues. That's a given. Keep in mind, I'm giving you all the, I'm giving you all the results and we can find the patterns together. Um, in the business resilience realm, their perspective was that it's ensuring impacted stakeholders are resilient enough to survive in an uncertain environment. So in this case, stakeholders can be anything from individuals to communities to cities. And health, it's safe moving in and out and within a, and within a country. It's ensuring the protection of all staff and beneficiaries. It's a blurred line between military and humanitarian actors and communication across all parties in conflict. Finally, internet, whoa, 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 I might move back. And internet, my remote has a mind of its own. Uh, lack of understanding of basic network and security co concepts is an issue. Lack of best practices without financial incentive and lack of strategies from long-term software solutions towards user friendliness, stability and security. Now, just taking a quick glance across those four columns, do you see some, some relationships, some parallels, some of the issues, and some could fall into the other fields? Say yes or no. I need head nods or I'm not moving on. No, I heard a no. You don't see any parallels? What do other people see? Okay, well, the cross-fertilization is beginning. Keep, we'll keep going. Hit next. There we go. Okay. So, what is the impact of these issues that I've brought, or that I've discussed? They're not being addressed. This is a brief list of some of them that were were brought up by the participants. Um, economic disaster ties very nicely into the theme of this presentation. Uh, as well, we have death, suing the government, reputation damage, ceased operations, failure to eradicate disease increased organized crime and lack of trust. Now reading these, it's not that clear which of the four groups they're coming from, correct? I see nods. So we're starting to see a little bit of overlap. Okay, so how are you preparing for these critical security issues? This is a breakdown of how all four are preparing. Um, Maybe it's my personal bias, but I was very impressed with what the Canadian government is now doing, which is this corner right here. Um, they've actually developed a matrix based on 13 different indicators that evaluate the safety and security of all their missions that draw on data from their threat assessments. And they're using this one matrix to help them identify how to alloc allocate resources and mitigation measures to all their embassies overseas, which is actually quite progressive. Um, in the resilience, organizational resilience world, they have a resilience uh, 13 indicator model, which is actually very interesting as well. You can actually download a five minute model or a five minute assessment on the internet and do it. And you can do it for an organization. You can try it on the individual level. They're working on that. Um, but it's, 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 yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, then over here we've got, this is the health side of things. A lot of these response or preparedness strategies are pretty common to crisis preparedness. Uh, and then on the bottom we've got our internet preparedness strategies. How are we doing for time, Robert? Nine minutes? Okay. Government role. What's the government role? We can see there's a lot more negatives than positives. Are we surprised? Everyone's tired or thinking about the beach. I don't know which one of those. <laughs> uh, so just to highlight a few th key things, 
uh, for the government role. Um, I guess on the negatives, there was a big emphasis on enhancing the self-reliance of civilians, um, discussion of neutrality, which is a very big topic that applies to a lot of our contexts. Um, what else is important that we need to discuss? Proposal space. Oh, you can read. That, that stuff's not as interesting, I think. Um, what are some of the lessons learned that can be applied to these disciplines? This is where I, th I think it gets kind of cool. Ah. Okay, so from the EM, emergency management, physical security side, they say, based on their experience, this, these are some of the observations they have uh, on security. Typically, there's no common approach. How many of you can say there's no common approach to secure, securing things? Yeah, that's a lot of hands. Good. Well, not good. But that's a, that, that's, that's a common issue that I think is faced across fields, which indicates we need to start working on developing something a little bit more streamlined. Uh, the second is that there's not enough emphasis on recovery. So when we think about planning for crisis, when we think about securitizing, we often think about preparedness, we often think about response, and we also think about mitigation, but we don't really think about how involved the process of recovery is. Um, and in turn, when we think about recovery, a good example is if you think about a flood in Alberta, we think of recovery as how much money will we rely on to get us back and running. That's it. We don't think about psychosocial implications. We don't think about the community, about businesses. It's very bare bones. Um, <clears throat> so there's need to think more about recovery. The other thing is, and I liked this, I thought it was clever, security and emergency management go together like salt and pepper. Um, similar to the other talks we've heard just now, security is, not, is often not integrated into emergency management, but it should be. Haiti wouldn't have existed without security. Uh, so then there's a need to start integrating the two, especially from the cyber realm, uh, and I'll get into that more briefly. From the organizational resilience side, the recommendation is practice. Is that a surprise? I see, uh, I'll take the nods as a yes, as a no, as it's not a surprise. Um, when we talk about practice in this sense, we talk about, if we think about responding to crisis, preparing for crisis, we're talking about human beings. We're ta not talking about machines. So to be able to effectively prepare for crisis, we need to practice. And part of practicing essentially means not waiting to practice in the crisis, but practicing every day. And to do that, there are three things that we can do. It's important to start relationship building, and we do that on a small scale. We do that every day with our colleagues, with our families, with our communities. We start working together, caring for each other, problem solving with one another. We also create good leaders, because at the end of the day, if you have a great plan and a poor leader, what's going to happen? What? Nothing will... <laughs> I'd be more confident if I have a good leader and a bad plan than a good plan and a bad... <laughs> we have a good leader back there. <laughs> uh, and a good... You know where I was going with that. Um, so yeah, so that's important. The third thing is, is if we practice, practice these things on a small scale, by the time we go large scale, by the time we actually have a crisis, it's habitual. So practice up. Health. They mentioned from their experience that plans are always changing. I think we all can be aware of that, but yet we often don't want to keep referring to the plan. Um, but it is important to continuously refer to our plan. Um, know the context. It's important that when you're thinking about security that you take into account all lenses so you think about all the different factors um, and common languages is, is very helpful. From the internet perspective, cooperation and relationship building and trust. Huh, that sounds like someone else's feedback. I think that was what um, we found in resilience. So it's good to see that's come out in both realms. Uh, and information sharing. Okay, so what would the people like to gain from other dis disciplines? So what, what would these experts I interviewed like to know from you? 
From the emergency management realm, there's a huge gap, kind of like I was saying, between emergency management and security and academia, actually. So what they were recommending or requesting is to help bridge that gap, um, especially in the cybersecurity realm. Um, at the moment, a lot of the a lot of the staff in embassies or overseas are assigned with with cyber roles and assigned to security officers and are responsible for securing networks and the secure communications of their staff, yet they don't have the training. Um, so there's a lack of communication between the emergency management world that is responsible for this and the actual cybersecurity information that's required. Um, and because of this, we need more cybersecurity for dummies. The problem essentially is that most of them have bare bones cybersecurity training, so Norton Antivirus is what they, what they pitch and they think that that's all that, that they need to pitch, but there's a, a need for training on cybersecurity that's not as high level, more low level, more generalizable to everybody. The organizational resilience. They said that they'd like to know about more about personal and community resilience. They felt that there's a lot that can be gained from talking to psychologists about how to deal with security in crisis. Health. They just wanted to know what people were doing because they're always trying to learn. MSF is very transparent. They're a very successful organization, uh, and they're always trying to, and as, we can, as, I, as I'm sure we all know, Security is very important to them, especially for the lives of their staff. So they're always wanting to know what everyone else is doing, how they're doing it, how they're coping, and what are their strategies. They also need help with secure communications. They actually use very little technology in their operations. When they think technology, they think Swiss Army knives. They don't think technology in the sense of our discussions. So there's a lot of room there to work with them on, on areas like this. And then the internet, the internet group. How does each sector work? What is critical? What are their constraints? And how can we help each other? I hope that you notice that these questions are the questions we asked. So it's good that we're asking the questions that others want to know of each other. It's just that we need to keep this dialogue going. This is just the beginning. So the last, the last question was, what can the IGF do to promote an engaged and constructive dialogue on this issue? We've got a little to-do list here. So the community should engage with the emergency management community more. They're not reaching out to the cyber world, so the cyber world should really start reaching out to them. Go to conferences, start trying to get into their magazines and their journals and start talking to them. There's a lot of room in that area for the involvement of cyber. Security, EM, and academia should work more together. We should be promoting dialogue, which is the whole point of this conference. Enhance understanding of technology, internet, communication, community information sharing. And everyone takes responsibility for their part. Oh, and read Ron Diebert's books. That was actually a recommendation by one of our, our interviewees. Okay, so we have a little simulation. How are we for time? 20 minutes? Okay, so I have a few. I've, I've tried to solicit some participants for this. Uh, if the participants that we are interested in coming up would like to come up now. Come on up. I will, like, if, if anyone else is interested, just to, excited to get up out of their chair and try something different, you can come on up and, and uh, try to get involved in what we're going to do. We're going to run you through an, a sample emergency. Come on, let's see one more hand. Ah, come on up, why not? I like that daredevil attitude. Okay, so I should put it, I, I have a disclaimer there, but I'll read it out because it's important that, that we note this. Um, the opinions expressed in this situation room, we're now, we're now pretending we're in a situation room. So when the emergency hits, we're going to be the decision makers for the world. And so this is the only room there is. So we're going to be figuring out what to do. So the opinions expressed in here, 
It's important to know that they're not a reflection of the organizations that people are representing, and they're not uh, best practices that are being pitched by the organizations. Is that clear? Okay. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Can everybody read that? I can read it out. I love the microphone. When I was a kid, I just used to talk on and on and on at weddings. It's great. All right. I'll read, I'll read it out. Uh, so right now, this workshop is now half over. Ugh, when is it going to be over, you're thinking? And I know you're thinking that because I've seen some of you nodding off. So you've decided to check Twitter. Okay. When you check, tw when you check Twitter, gah, this is dying on me. This is what you saw. Do you see any oddities there? Can someone tell me if you see anything odd in this, in this stream? So, so, speak up. Yell it out. There's a, yes, that's an important thing. There's a tidal wave coming. Where did you see that? Oh, look at that. So the IGF has just sent us a tweet that there's seismic activity in, on the Pacific, potential tidal wave headed to SEA, hashtag IGF 2013, are you ready? Then Bali Tourism Board has also sent out a tweet. Travelers, tsunami warning, war, sort of tsunami warning in effect, verify evacuation procedures with your hotels, hashtag IGF 2013. This might be a simulation, might not, I don't know. So right now, emergency management, the context of this discussion aside, just for, just for fun, how many of you have actually gone to your hotels and know what to do if there's a tsunami? Okay, that's not bad. Run? Run? <laughs> Sorry, what, you said something? Oh, yeah, that's probably not a good idea. Okay, yeah, I went to the, I went to my, to the, the visitor desk the other day and I asked them, and the guy at the desk is like, I don't think we have emergency procedures for a tsunami. I was like, uh, you know, are you sure? Because the hotel beside you has a lot of signs saying where to go. And he's like, I don't know. We don't have procedures. And I was, and I was like, well, maybe, do you think you could maybe just call someone to find out? And so he calls, he calls one group of people, and no one answers. And he calls someone else, and he's like, oh, they don't know. And then he goes to talk to the manager, and the manager's busy, and then he ends up taking 20 minutes, and finally he comes back, and he has these procedures. But it got me thinking, you know, if he doesn't know them, how many people do? It's not, it's not a good thing. Uh, so in this case, this is the situation. We see this. Okay, panelists, you might be ready. Okay, so I'll pass it over to you. At this point, with this information alone, I'm curious to where you would start. Questions, what would you do? Who are you going to contact? Well, these are questions for you to think about. And this is not a discussion necessarily to the audience. This is a discussion for everyone. You can just get the ball rolling. So you can think about what would you do? Who are you going to contact? Who's responsible for what? How quickly do you need to be able to respond? How would you assess the situation? Check your assumptions. How can you work together? So, uh, from our, just a useful information from our previous panel, because our moderator from that panel informed us that this is only two-story building, and apparently the people who survived tsunamis in some other places had to be in three-story building, you know, so that's already good information to most probably to have that, uh, that this building most probably is not the most appropriate building to survive the tsunami. So, f so first, you know, one of the things is to, to at least to try to identify, uh, you know, to try to identify place uh, where, where, the, where actually survival chances would be higher than here. So I'll just stop it here, I think, for other turn. Yeah. It's actually funny because I thought you were going to have some kind of cybersecurity related uh, scenario, and that's exactly the scenario that I was going to bring out that, hey, but from a physical perspective, what do we do, right? 
so physical and cyber, are we really prepared in either case? Um, but if it was me, right, and I actually thought about it as I was walking to the convention center today and I saw the, you know, big wave and person pointing that way, and I go, oh, if something happens, I guess I'll go that way, but I don't know for how long, and should I be using a car or running? But if, if I was looking at the tweet and I saw that, what I would do immediately is get in, uh, in contact with the conference organizers because my assumption, it might be an erroneous assumption, but I would place the fault on them, is that they should be prepared for emergencies. And so hopefully they would actually have a team that would be responsible for even physical emergencies. And that would be my first point of contact. Just um, the th same thing that I thought, but I would think about contacting the conference organizers to alert everyone that doesn't have a Twitter like me. So I don't tweet and I don't have a Twitter. So it's really that to to get the word around a little bit more. And talking about tsunami, in my hotels I saw plenty of things on how to do a tsunami and not a fire thing. So if, that, if there's a fire, maybe I should go to the fourth floor and the second building, but there is nothing about fires, but a lot about tsunamis. So it's the thing that people think about one threat and not another. So it's, it's it's interesting to see. Just to, no, just to adding. But uh, the only problem is, I think, and there are a lot of people in this building. And, uh, you know, if everyone contacted conference organizers directly, you know, it can be, you know, it's a long time can be passing. So if we're talking about our personal security, the question is how you actually try not to cause panic, you know, by informing everyone around. So, and then how you try to, how you try to actually you know, make sure that you put your own contingencies that are not depending on a congestion of that, you know, one information spot. So we would have a DDoS attack to the conference organizers. Yes, so that we don't avoid the DDoS attack to the conference organizers. It, you know, but it, it brings out, um, it, you know, something that you should have an incident response plan, which also everybody should have been aware of prior. Right, and so even from a physical perspective, had I come to the conference somewhere, I should have had a brochure in terms of if there's a tsunami, who do I contact? Because this is a likelihood in this particular location. Same if, if I'm you know, going to a conference in California or you know somewhere where there's earthquakes. So actually, to really be very diligent, right, in any conference to meet any multinational constituents where there's some emergency preparation be it cyber or physical, you should know who to contact and where to go, which obviously has not been done. And probably in, even in the physical world, isn't done as much as maybe it should, which reflects the cyber world also. I think when it comes to emergency situations, you always think of it as something that happened somewhere else and not to you. So my immediate reaction to seeing a tweet like that would doubts and I would think it's a hoax and it would take me what, what, what do you think? Somebody would have maliciously tweeted that one so that needs to be checked first before we go forward. Okay, so you're skeptical. The two of you are skeptical. Okay. One comment here? Okay. Uh, while a tsunami may not be that predictable, usually a tsunami accompanies a tropical storm or an earthquake or something, and some of these might be predictable, I don't know. So uh, if it is happening uh, just before a conference, the conference organizers have a duty to be prepared. So. Okay. Oh, you want that okay. Yes. Uh, uh, one comment that uh, you should 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 make the simulation before your presentation and we will... Oh, then uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's correct. And then, about the tsunami thing, actually, uh, it is uh, also uh, uh, predictable, like, the, like, like after the earthquake, earthquake. but how, how, how big the tsunami will, will it? I, I can't read the exact message oh, as the tweet. Money. Oh yeah, but how big? Because when 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 the Fukushima uh, quake happens, we in Indonesia are afraid. People in Indonesia are afraid that 
the tsunami will be coming over in several hours time. The tsunami did come, but only for 10 centimeters. Okay. So it's no danger at all. But it is a tsunami actually. <laughs> yeah, it was a, it was a tsunami. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, hopefully that doesn't happen in this scenario. Let's see what happens next. <laughs> um, so, okay, at this point, you are skeptical, actually, and you, just deci you decide to check international news sites for more credible information, but the page just keeps loading. My, I need new batteries. This is not fun. Okay, so the page just keeps loading. You can't actually access any international media sites to validate whether this is legitimate or not. So does this change? Any, any thoughts, any comments right now? on what? Because you, you should be starting to think about, is this real? Do I need to start acting? Or, but go ahead. Now, uh, now I make some assumptions about preparedness of Indonesian telecom operators. <laughs> but uh, normally, you know, one of the most real, two real, most reliable, reliable sources for information is radio. In this information, and many operators would have implemented the so-called cell broadcast. So that means you have to check for SMSs. One thing you shouldn't do in that situation to get your phone battery died by using data too much when it's not working, you know, when data's not working and using Wi-Fi too much because that's what surely will make a battery die. And you have to, one of the priorities there, especially as an emergency station, is to keeping your, your communications tool uh, as possible as, you know, active. So one of the advisors are kind of very simple ones. Switch off your Wi-Fi if it's not working, you know, so you keep your battery up. Check your SMSs. And if you still can, to so go through the phone, just call someone abroad, because usually that type of tsunami, you know, if there's a true tsunami that kind of causes, the people from abroad could check, could check for you and could, uh, could check information if you can still go through it. Uh, that's my just kind of initial reaction. That's great. Oh, we have a comment back there. I'll, go ahead, Donald. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because now, I mean, one of the things I would have also done, I'm in a lot of global communities, so I would have just sent out an email and go, anybody heard about this? Somebody can check, you know, some seismic, you know, parameters. So if all of a sudden my emails don't go through, I'm going, huh, what's going on now? Right? And I start thinking, well, maybe, maybe it's somebody just trying to cause fear, uncertainty, doubt, and panic. Or, you know, but I, it, it will raise questions in my mind for sure. Um, I believe one of the things I would have looked at was the USGS.gov, the US Geological Survey, because they have monitoring systems around the world for earthquakes and tsunamis. And why would you go to a news site when you can go to a definitive source okay. like that? So, yeah. yeah. Unless the government shut down and had prevented it from working. <laughs> <laughs> but then I have a point of that some of the things that is... Uh, why did we thought first going to the conference organizers? Because there is not a good point of contact. So we were not told who to contact. Like, I never heard of that website, so how the heck am I going to think about it? So I go to the source that I know. So this is one of the thing, the points that is really important to, to think about. It's really, I'm thinking about a citizen that don't know anything about tsunami, so I go to the conference organization and I hope that they know someone that can do something uh, for me. So it's, it's kind of to be prepared that you may be at this point of, of contact. If I may, um, there are different kinds of tsunamis. Um, one is caused by, by the earthquake in the immediate vicinity. If it's close, a uh, big earthquake happens close to where you are, you may have 15 minutes or 20. You, you have no time to go to the conference organizer. You have, you have to judge by yourself. And that happened in Japan. Many people tried to get the information. They waited, and they were killed. Um, I just read, just while hearing you guys on the, over the web, I just searched Bali and the earthquake. And in 1917, there was a big earthquake in the south part of Bali, which killed 15,000. By earthquake, not tsunami. Um, so there's no, and it says there has been no recorded tsunami in this part, but there's no guarantee. So I checked out with this building. It, it could be um, on top of the floor, Chances are higher. The, the, 
What we say in Japan is, if you find any sort of indication of tsunami, just find the highest, find the highest place you can within a reasonable reach, say 10 minutes. If you have a car, you try to um, escape from the car. That caused a lot of traffic um, jam, and many were caught by the water. By, and those who survived abandoned the car. They ran onto the hill. So these are the kind of tips um, we only learned from the disaster afterwards. Um, so um, you really have to judge by yourself is the first thing to do. And sometimes in Japan, they say, don't worry about your family. Leave your family behind. Otherwise, you'll be killed together. I had a question from you. And then before you, we'll give the next update, and then we'll come back to you. Yeah. Go ahead. So um, at ICANN meetings where um, I'm part of the security team there, on the back of the meeting badge is emergency contact numbers and details. So um, not every conference has that. It's not on the IGF badges, but on, on other conferences I've seen that, and it's helpful for participants. That's great, definitely. So one recommendation oh. to the IGF would be for them to, to do that. Definitely. Okay, I hold you both of these questions because we need to update, update the situation. This might change what you have to say. Probably not, but we'll see. So you return to Twitter and you see another tweet. We see a 7.8 magnitude earthquake hit outside Japan. And can you just sit next? Oh, there. Hmm, maybe this is real. That should say not international sites, but geological sites. And then you want to validate further, but your phone is returning this error message. In fact, everyone is receiving this message. You decide to open your email, but it won't send. SMTP servers appear offline. You try and log on to Twitter, Facebook. Ah, maybe it's happening right now. So somebody doing a Twitter denial of service attack? <laughs> I don't know. Keep going. Go back one. Yeah, so at this point, you try and log on to Twitter, Facebook. All of your accounts seem to not be accepting your passwords. Next. The Internet is very slow, but you still want to find out, is this real? After a drawn-out Google search, you find the local department responsible for weather alerts displays this. Okay, and that's where they... The, it, the next update stops. Okay, so we had a question back there. We'll come to you, Thomas, after. Go ahead. Uh, a, a comment. We're so reliant upon technology, we haven't thought to walk outside and look to see what the animals are doing. Yeah. Are the mm. birds leaving the beach? Are the squirrels climbing to the tops of the trees? Are the ants climbing up high in large numbers? All of those would be strong indicators that the animals are concerned and are getting to high ground. You don't necessarily need the internet to find out if a tsunami is coming. If awesome. there was a tsunami in Japan, we're pretty jolly safe here. We're a few thousand kilometres away, and there's a lot of islands between Japan and us mm -hmm. to, to break up the wave. Okay, awesome. <laughs> we have Thomas here, and then... Oh, you're saying no? No. I will come back to you. Yeah. Okay. I'm just uh, adding in terms of... Uh, one single number, and I think it still can be valid because, and that's I have to push on the ITU's promotion here a bit because, you know, one thing that, that's been done is harmonized the international emergency number. That means that, you know, it's 112 or 911 in most of the countries would get you without a SIM and without uh, connectivity to, without your own operator on any operator's network, even if your phone is locked to the operator. And that's again the strength and uh, another outcome of the, of the World Conference of National Telecommunications is this harmonization that's now even kind of stronger. So that means even if you don't know the phone number, you should try, you know, and if you don't know anything about that, 112 and two, uh, nine, or 911 in most of the countries will, you know, will get to the immune with a SIM failure. So that's gonna, just one more thing to try. Uh, 
It's true that it's highly unlikely if any um, earthquake happens in Japan that will hit Bali. Um, I, I'm just looking at the map. But when the Chile's big earthquake happened in, um, I think it's like 50 years ago, a big tsunami came to Japan. And, and that's part of the reason why there was an early warning center or tsunami warning center is put in place in Hawaii, watching both ways. And they were concerned when Japan had the earthquake, it could have some, you know, effect to Chile back. But also, sometimes the, these waves are reflected. So it's not one straight wave this way and back. And also it's 3D, depends on the shape of your um, bottom of your, the sea. That's, it's far more complex than people may think. So um, I don't know, but... Um, Last year, there was some 6.8 Richter scale earthquake happened in Bali as well. And that may cause a local tsunami. And often you have no time to see the animals and stuff again. Yeah. There's no guarantee for that at all. Yep. Oh, no, I think he, this guy here had a question or comment. Uh, yeah, a couple of comments. When, when there's an earthquake, which is, you might not feel an earthquake. It could be a thousand miles away, but you can still get the tsunami. Uh, I was in Chile for the, the earthquake there uh, a couple of years back. And we were told by the government emergency team that there would be no tsunami. But they were incorrect, and that killed uh, a couple of hundred people. Um, so one element here is time as well. If you have very little time sometimes. So if you suspect there's a tsunami, the, the main thing you do is to get to higher ground, no matter where it is, and then think about response and think about other things. Uh, certainly don't wait till technology fails before you act. Excellent. Thank you. So, so a comment that I want to make is the minute that I heard that, you know, now I can't get access to the Internet, um, I see a website defacement, right, then I know that there's something more going on, and I try to really realistically, I'm going, okay, this could be actually uh, uh, a targeted attack, right, that is causing fear and panic for whatever reason. And this really strikes me as something that really should be a takeaway for everybody in terms of just realizing that a lot of times the physical world uh, or the vir virtual attacks mimic sometimes what's going on in the physical world. And I will bring as an example um, the attacks that happened in Estonia back in 2007 that started with physical riots, okay, they only lasted for a day or two, but then you had the mimicking of the riots in terms of a DDoS attack in the virtual world, right? And so we can't just take one without the other, and you have to have checks and balances. And I think from any national emergency response plan, you have to address both the physical and the virtual and together and not separately. So I think this is one of my takeaways from this particular scenario. Otherwise I can wrap up. Good wrap up. Yeah. So, uh, it, so for the for the, we're just here at the wrap up because we've hit we've hit the the top of the hour. And the thing is that though there have been two very parts of the of the workshop, the the attempt was just in terms of recognizing that there are both cybersecurity best practices, um, and there's also best practices from other communities. And not paying attention to the best practices, whether it's to be prepared, whether it's learning from other communities, um, when there's a, pro you can help min reduce the, 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 the issues that can exist, and you can react a lot uh, faster. And so what, what, what's interesting here is that we, we, we picked a scenario that, that, that's common to this part of the world. Um, we equally could have done something in regards to cyber that you, uh, Mary Kay, I think, mentioned, uh, mentioned earlier. And the thing is, um, we have to share best practices. This was in the workshop that took place actually immediately before this one in the room next door, is working and understanding the the ways that other stakeholder groups can understand those messages. And so I think if there's something that, that I learned, I guess, from this is there's a whole community of best practice in terms of preparedness. Um, and there's, they don't necessarily talk as often, though they may have approaches to educate end users. Um, so, um, and that's maybe perhaps where, where we learn. And if we don't, I would say that there's a certain irresponsibility um, and not 
uh, looking at the best practices and learning from them, and then that's a problem for all of us. So with, with that, I want to wrap up, and if there's any last-minute questions or comments, we'll open it to the floor, and I'll maybe just um, uh, start with, with, the, with the two panels, if there's any concluding comments, and then we'll be done. Please. I would just encourage everybody to really look at figuring out in your own environments how you can get people to implement some of the best current practices from a security perspective. And I know that, you know, there's many of them. So, you know, even if you look at best current practice for one item, you might see 100 documents, and they're similar but different, right? But I would encourage at least to have the dialogue within your constituents, um, um, within your countries, and look at what makes sense in your own environments um, and, you know, um, and also work with your national certs if possible, right? The governments, the certs, the business holders, um, and really have that dialogue. And incident response is key. Because it's never that, you know, how, do you, how, how much do you prepare for a security incident? Something's going to happen at some time, and how quickly can you mitigate the issues when it does happen? I would just, uh, I think, uh, say that everything that she said, I would <laughs> concur. But um, one of the things, I don't know if you noticed, when we started to discuss this scenario, um, that's something that happens when there's an incident. We start dwelling on the details and we lose the big pictures. And this is what we did here when we were talking about it. And I think this is one of the challenges and we need to be open also to, to talk to different stakeholders and to understand sometimes the motivations, the reasons and why some things are not being done and why they're difficult, and then try to implement as best as possible all the best practices. And I think this is one of the ways to move forward. So with that, I'd like to just uh, uh, thank Jenny and, and Mary Kay and Christine for uh, being the panel, and all of you for coming um, to, the, to the session at the, at the end of the day. So a round of applause for, for everyone. Uh, thank you so very much. And enjoy, I guess, the, the gala that's starting um, or it's that tomorrow or some anyway so anyway good good evening all <laughs> thank you very much